Hello, a very warm greeting and welcome to the Global Alliance for Tibet and Persecuted Minorities. My name is Sering Pasang and I'm founder of this platform. At the Global Alliance for Tibet and Persecuted Minorities, we engage in advocacy and campaigning work for Tibetans as well as those facing persecutions under the Chinese Communist regime. We highlight China's gross violation of human rights, lack of democracy, curtailment of, of freedom of speech and political freedom for all the persecuted people. Today, we are delighted to host this webinar. Is China a threat to global peace and security? With a panel of distinguished China-Tibet experts, human rights advocates, and a former Tibetan minister. I thank and welcome our guests from London and from the United States. Here is Professor Dibesh Anand, Kasur Lopsanyenda, and Stephen Sherar. A short introduction. Exactly 72 years ago this month, Mao Zedong declared the invasion of Tibet and the Republic of East Turkestan in the uh, in the name of peaceful liberation. That so-called peaceful liberation has cost millions of lives of Tibetans and Uyghur people, amongst others. The Chinese government is hosting a week-long celebration of what it calls the Golden Week, as first, first October marks the 72nd founding anniversary of the People's Republic of China. All those communities who face persecutions have been engaging in public protests against the CCP regime last week. In London too, with our partners, the Global Alliance for Tibet and Persecutor Minorities organized a protest and, and rally. Beijing may be celebrating, but for the Tibetan and Uyghur victims under the Chinese regime's military occupation and its repressive policy, there is nothing to celebrate as long as China continues to illegally occupy Tibet and East Turkestan. For the people of Hong Kong, there's nothing to celebrate so long as Beijing disregards the UK-China joint declaration and the basic rights are, re are not restored in Hong Kong. For the people of Taiwan, there's nothing to celebrate when their democratic nation faces the imminent threat of military invasion from the Chinese regime. There's nothing to celebrate so long as the Southern Mongolians cannot maintain their own language and Buddhist culture. Certainly, there's nothing to celebrate so long as the Falun Gong, as well as other religious and faith communities cannot practice their devotions. And the list goes, goes on, including the lack of political freedom, democracy, and freedom of speech. Since Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, his, his regime has made no secret of its global expansionist ambition. With the launch of Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank, AIB, and other institutions, China's Belt and Road Initiative projects have now become debt traps for developing countries. The Hamben Tota port in Sri Lanka is a typical example. This port located in the Indian Ocean, it's of great strategic interest to China. As Sri Lanka could not repay its mounting debt, China has secured a 99 year lease of the port. There are already indications that Beijing might deploy its military installations in this strategic location. The political instability caused by Beijing with its claims over the international waters in the South China Sea is the tipping point of serious concern that led to the AUKUS, that's Australia, United Kingdom and the US nuclear submarine deal 
to counter China's assertion in the Indo-Pacific region. Meanwhile, Beijing's flexing of its muscle, military muscle in the Himalayan borders through territorial claims against India, Bhutan and Nepal is yet another dangerous game that Chinese regime is actively pursuing. And it could spark a major war between the two Asian giants. Needless to mention, China's strategic diversion of Tibet's river to mainland China through the building of hundreds of dams, which will not only cause an environmental catastrophe, but affect the lives of over a billion people downstream who depend on it for irrigation, water supplies, and transport in countries including India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Thailand. So to discuss whether China poses a real threat to regional and global peace and security, I'm now going to introduce you, our panel of experts, to share their thoughts on these vital issues. After the opening remarks, we will then have time for question and answer session. Now, I would like to introduce Professor Divesh Anand, who is an associate professor at London's Westminster University, an expert on majority minority, minority relations in China and India, and the author of Geopolitical Exotica, Tibet in Western Imagination. Professor Anand has written extensively in international journals and papers. He has also given lectures in universities and think tanks around the world, a very well-known uh, face in the Tibet circle as well. He is currently the head of the school, Social Sciences at the University of London. Our second speaker is Kasul Lopsang Yenda, a former minister for the Tibetan government in exile, also known as the Central Tibet Administration from 2001 to 2006. He served as the Dalai Lama's representative to North America, based at the Office of Tibet in New York. He was also an elected Tibetan MP in the Tibetan parliament from 1996 to 2001. A leader of the Tibetan Youth Congress, Lobsang founded and served as the executive director of the Tibetan Center for Human Rights and Democracy, our Human Rights Watch inside Tibet. Currently, he is the president of the Tibet Fund, a New York-based NGO that raises funds and supports the Tibetan community primarily in India and Nepal through education, healthcare, and community development projects. And our third and final speaker and guest is Stephen Sherrar, who is the author of Surviving Chinese Communist Detention. Stephen survived communist Chinese incarceration, torture, and deportation. Stephen is a proud first-generation American from California's Bay Area, and it's a proud biracial son of immigrants' parents from Switzerland and Mexico. He was the first person in his family to attend university, earning a degree in chemistry from Sonoma State University in Northern California. In addition to English, Stephen also speaks Mandarin, Spanish, and successfully co-founded a business in Beijing in his mid-20s. Stephen is a staunch advocate for and defender of freedom, liberty, the constitution, free market capitalism, human rights, and American way, and is very active on the social media as well. Now, I would like to invite Professor Dibesh Anand to speak. You have to unmute me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sering, for inviting us, and uh, thanks for asking me to do the opening remarks here. I'll take a few minutes and then pass it on to other speakers. Uh, it's quite important that we speak of whether China poses a threat to global peace and security or not. There's a growing recognition around the world, but not equally. Remember, not all countries see China as a threat. In fact, some see China as a possible partner rather than a threat. So we have to acknowledge that there are different, different viewpoints in different parts of the world. That's number one. Number two, recently, of course, China celebrated the fact that it had, you know, 1949, it became People's Republic of China. I would give a perspective which is broadly, I would say, a left critique of China rather than other critics of China, right? So I would, I see myself as someone who's progressive and left-wing. 
but i find china to be a far right country in terms of how it practices racism how it practices majoritarian nationalism and how it is aggressive so that's my viewpoint here in this context now china does not pose a threat in my view one reaction in the us and other places is to see china threat and they can be sometimes not always a sinophobic racist element to it right chinese people are inherently somehow bad and authoritarian and hence china is a threat i do not adopt that position china i would argue is a threat to global peace and security because china behaves the way in which western colonial powers have behaved in the past and continue to behave in certain parts of the world so china is a threat to global peace and security for two broad reasons one because it is a neo colonial power so when we take example of belt and road initiative one belt one road initiative we see that china is not an equal partner china uses and weaponizes its economic aid economic investment economic trade for political purposes right so china is behaving like a neo colonial power the way china behaves in africa china behaves now in central asia southeast asia is similar to how european powers particularly us and uk sorry uk and france but also us have behaved in different parts of the world right and that is why i say china is a threat to global peace and security because china is a neo colonial power now one may say but what makes china uniquely problematic i would say no point looking at china as a unique le dangerous power because at the heart of chinese national nation state project lies the claim that china is not west china is not western china is not colonial so the moment you say china is a colonial power they say but we are not colonial because we are not western for me that itself is a self defeating analysis and argument made by china, defenders of china when i say defenders of china remember it's not only chinese government but a large number of what we pejoratively call tankies tankies would be the left wing defenders of china could forget what left is supposed to be about and will admire china regardless of what it does so if us denies human rights abuses that's wrong but if china denies human rights abuses somehow it's all right that's the kind of tankies we are talking about and we know there are a lot of defenders of china in the west in india also in left wing circle and i'm also a critic of it from a left wing perspective so china is a threat to global peace and security because uh, china is essentially one that is neo colonial but china is also colonial so for instance if take example of tibetans and uyghurs and we can focus on that and now of course hong kong people also china behaves in a classical colonial as a classical colonial power it erases the identity of these people it reduces the identity of these people to singing dancing happy natives and not someone who have the right to self determination it oppresses them exploits them but ultimately argues that tibetans and uyghurs have no right to determine what they want it's chinese government that will shape it right so that's colonial so china is not only neo colonial as it is in africa in asia especially central asia and southeast asia china is a full fledged colonial power when it comes to hong kong tibet and east turkestan of in the homeland of uyghur people and the fact that is colonial power a lot of time the people outside china may think that you know that's their problem like tibetan issue is i mean even let's say your organization you call it persecuted minorities but the persecuted minorities may not see themselves as persecuted minorities so i would say tibetans are not persecuted minorities uyghurs are not persecuted minorities that those who have been minoritized by the chinese state otherwise they are occupied people so i would say persecuted people rather than persecuted minority because the moment we accept uyghurs and tibetans and hong kong people as minorities of china we in a way have given the right to beijing to decide who's a minority who's majority whose homeland they occupy so i would say that china is a global is a threat to global peace and security because of its colonial nature it's a threat to global peace and security because of its neo colonial behavior and it's of course a, a threat to global peace and security in terms of its behavior in terms of aggressive with its neighbors but the answer to that and we may do that maybe during question answer answer to that is not demonize china as uniquely evil and uniquely problematic but to recognize that the problem the main problem for me is not china and how it behaves the main problem is how contemporary world is being shaped by colonialism and neo colonialism 
of which China is the biggest beneficiary and practitioner in that part of the world. So until and unless he challenge the principles of colonialism and the practice of colonialism and new colonialism, I don't think we can challenge China. And finally, I would say, of course, where China is different from many countries in the world, not all countries, many countries in the world is, you have got a party that controls the state. You've got a party that controls the nation. And therefore, we're not talking of People's Republic of China, we're talking of Party's Republic of China. Given that there's no accountability at all, no democratic, no kind of accountability that party has in the region, we are dealing with a very strong authoritarian state that has potential to create a new piece of its own, new piece, not, and that new piece will be based on an imperial China rather than a genuinely post colonial China. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll come back to you for question, uh, later on at the Q&A session. And I would like to invite uh, Lop Sang Yenta to speak. Thank you, Sir Prasad. Uh, I, I would like to say that um, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, you know, the world really believed that this was the uh, beginning of the end of communism and its ideology. And however, uh, the fact that the, the Chinese Communist Party celebrated its 100th anniversary uh, is, is, a, is a message to the world that communism uh, can thrive and succeed uh, beyond the 21st century. Uh, in, in those days, uh, communist ideology was treated as an existential threat to the values, uh, to the liberal values and democracy. Uh, many of those leaders have experienced then, uh, you know, totalitarianism in all forms, including fascism and, and communism. And, and they acutely understand that these political systems are threat to individual liberty and freedom and to the global peace and security. Uh, but unfortunately, in recent decades, uh, world leaders have focused mainly on economic interest of one's own country. Uh, there were days when U.S. president you know, awarded most favored nation status to China just a year after uh, the massacre of students at Tiananmen Square. Uh, even UK Prime Minister once proudly announced that his country is the largest trading partner of China. And Australia, in fact, once almost gave away with, uh, its, its economic freedom by becoming totally dependent on Chinese trade and commerce. So in pre-COVID-19 times, you know, there used to be a competition amongst countries around the world on how best to appease Chinese leaders and further their, you know, further boost their economic relations uh, with them. So this is precisely the reason I believe that why Chinese Communist Party has thrived thus far and has become a superpower to the detriment of democratic countries. It is a fact that the Western countries, especially the democratic countries, have contributed significantly in strengthening uh, the Chinese Communist Party. You know, there is a geopolitical shift in international politics in recent times. Uh, many countries have finally realized that China is posing a real threat to the uh, peace and security of the world. Of course, I'm not an expert on specific threats, uh, you know, China is posing to the world, but there are ample evidences, including militarization of South China Sea, the cyber warfare, you know, going on, the border uh, intrusions uh, and interferences in, in democratic processes of other countries. And these are posing unprecedented threat uh, to the very survival of liberal values as well as the uh, global security. Uh, the world, in fact, has faced uh, similar challenges in the past uh, with Nazi Germany, uh, the Soviet Union, and, and most recently with Islamic extremists. You know, the recognition that the Chinese Communist Party or the communist system is an existential threat to liberal values is a fundamental shift in the policy of major democratic countries. Uh, with this fundamental change in, in perception, you know, democratic countries uh, led by the United States have been preparing themselves 
to counter uh, Chinese threats. And uh, you know they have built alliances like of like-minded countries, uh, as you said most recently, the AUKUS alliance on nuclear submarine. Uh, you know different measures are being taken by different countries in curbing China's aggressive military posture and territorial Im ambitions. But it will not be an easy task uh, to change China's behavior. Uh, in in recent months. China has stepped up its efforts uh, you know, to improve its international relations, including European Union, the Asian countries, the Arabian countries. China even held uh, you know, annual economic dialogue with European Union on trade. Uh, Chinese leaders are reaching out to India's uh, neighboring countries like Pakistan, Nepal, Afghanistan. You know, they have built uh, you know, China, Russia, Iran uh, alliance to counter US-led you know, challenges to their ambition to, the, to rule the world. Uh, nevertheless, you know, I believe that the fundamental change in perception that the Chinese Communist, Communist Party is a threat to global peace and security will remain for a long time, even though Professor you know, uh, DBH has said that there are differences of, uh, you know, uh, of opinions. Not all the countries in the world uh, you know, do believe that China is, a, uh, is, is an existential threat, uh, but nevertheless, the major uh, you know, democratic countries, they do believe now that there is a, a, you know, a threat from uh, China. And this perception will remain for a very, very long time to come. Unless China changes its aggressive behavior, I believe that China will continue to face uh, formidable challenges uh, from the U.S. and its alliances. Okay, thank you very much, Lob uh, And now we'd like to invite Stephen. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, um, especially amongst uh, some very you know, bright and intelligent minds in the world of China. Um, for me, I, I, I like to stick to the kind of fundamental question being posed, which is, is China a threat to global peace and security? And my contention has always been unequivocally yes. And even if you don't take my word for it or the word of you know, international human rights advocates, it's as easy as being directed to what the CCP has been speaking about, uh, writing about, uh, whether we look at un, uh, uh, unrestricted warfare, whether we look at speeches by Chur Hao Tien, uh, for the better part of decades, um, speaking about the need to supplant the US uh, to kind of replace the West uh, and to create a Chinese-led century. Now, for me, um, a lot of people might take my personal experience out of context and say, well, you know, he's spiteful, he's vengeful, he went to China with hopes and ambitions and was uh, unfairly dragged into a black site Chinese communist prison cell in the middle of nowhere, uh, nearly killed and then deported from the country. And so he's, he's just trying to get even. And that might be all well and good. Uh, but at the end of the day, once you've gone through that experience and the Chinese Communist Party has nearly taken your life, uh, one of the things that really China boils down to that does make it unique, in my opinion, from the rest of the world is one statistic. <clears throat> and that one statistic that I generally point and refer people back to, Amnesty International, you can look up Human Rights Watch, is that China every single year kills more of its own citizenry than the rest of the world combined. This is state-sanctioned execution. This is more than the rest of the world, every other country, every single year. This includes the largest executioners, this includes the United States, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, Pakistan, uh, India, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Every single year, the Chinese government, in order to obtain its objectives, is willing to kill more of its own people uh, to the tune of we don't even know how many thousands are killed because it's state secret and national security uh, than the rest of the world combined. And they know and they do this year after year after year. So we don't have to really wonder where China's expansionary movement is heading. We can look at it in real time. We can look at places like Xinjiang and China's Northwest. We can look at what China has done to repress any independent or dissenting, dissenting voices in Hong Kong, Hong Kong. We can look at what China will do uh, if it is allowed to expand into certain places uh, along the border in India, into Taiwan, uh, expansion into the South China Sea, 
Uh, we know what its ambitions are. We know what it does to its own people. Uh, it's now testing the waters as well with foreign nationals to see if it can get away with nearly killing people like myself who broke a law in China. But forget about breaking a law. Let's say you're just there as a Canadian national, an Indian national, people who, by the way, European countries that I was locked up with myself, uh, if you break no law, but your government does something that China dislikes, well, now you're going to be on the receiving end of hostage diplomacy, as this is the case with the two Michaels out of Canada, uh, or the Canadian national that is often unspoken about, the third Canadian national who was uh, sentenced for a drug charge, uh, where they uh, retroactively went back and changed his drug charge uh, and said, well, no, now we're just going to put you on death row and kill you. Uh, and so the question goes back to a very basic premise in my mind. If this is a country that is readily, willingly, and, and able to consistently make this decision that, hey, every single year we're going to kill more of our own people to obtain the economic objectives uh, than the rest of the world combined, and also threaten the lives of guests in our country, foreign nationals, who are here building businesses, working with our you know, domestic population, uh, marriage, children, the full spectrum, and we're willing to risk their lives as well. Um, is that a threat to global peace and prosperity at scale? Uh, and to me, the, the recurring answer to that has unequivocally been yes. Thank you very much. I think uh, all three of you have one thing very common is that you all have visited China. Um, Dibesh as uh, academic, uh, Lobsang as political uh, um, figure, and uh, Stephen as a business. So I think uh, you all have this uh, direct experience. Uh, now what I would like to do is I would like to go back to Dibesh and ask uh, a question. And then, then I'll, I'll come uh, for what's uh, Lobsang and uh, Stephen later. Dibesh, uh, you have visited uh, China and interacted with the scholars. And I'm sure you met with some leaders as well over there, officials. You have also organized so many conferences on China, Tibet, East Turkestan, among others, uh, important subject at your university. And I have, I've had the opportunity to attend some of those conferences. Now, by doing all this, you, as I said earlier, you engage with scholars, activists, political figures from all these communities. What things as academic have you learned or, or observed from these, uh, through these interactions that you think can help to shape or find some sort of common grounds and therefore bring some sort of solutions to the China-Tibet issue, for instance? Uh, thanks, uh, Serin, for a very important question. So to set the record straight, right, while I'm a professor of politics and international relations, working on Tibet, China, minority majority in India, also other areas, my passion, one of the passions, one of the not only passion, one of the passions lies around recognizing and making sure that we see Tibetans as producers of their own knowledge. Because some, when I enter into academic space 20 years ago in the UK, in the West in general, I noticed that Tibet was studied. But Tibetans are not studied, or rather, Tibetans are studied, but Tibetans were not seen as equal subjects. So generally, there was a culture where, particularly, white Westerners would take the responsibility upon themselves to speak for Tibetans. Now, my position is very clear that I'm here to speak along with, not for Tibetans, but along with Tibetans, in order to highlight the voices of Tibetans who are persecuted my, uh, uh, people. That's for me the politics. Now. Within my university, I've hosted Chinese government delegations, I think three to four delegations in the past. This is after 2008. One, there was large-scale protest in uh, Tibet. In, in Tibet, You had Chinese government selling, sending, as I said, you see, scholarly delegation. I put scholarly because it was a half the time very official also. All of them were managed by the Chinese embassy. Now, of course, being in London, they approached me, and I strongly believe that we need to give platform also. So I gave platform. I did make it clear that it would be open to everyone. I'm not sure, saying maybe you were also there. I remember it was very heated. You can imagine where there was a protest, large scale 
here are almost 150 Tibetans in the audience, and you had delegations from China, where you had Tibetans, but also Chinese speakers. But I have to, it, I had to take the responsibility that there would be no major protest or clash because I did want Tibetans in exile to at least listen to and question scholars from China. And I have to give the credit to embassy there, and I make it clear embassy was involved here that at least they didn't shut the debate immediately. So they allowed that to happen. Now, frankly, I don't think the embassy wanted the views to change and they really were interested in dialogue. Their interest was how to ch change the perception in the UK, right? So that was their agenda. So, see, so the agenda of the embassy was how to create some space for Chinese viewpoint in the UK. My agenda was to give platform to everyone and give allow Tibetans to at least interact. And then, of course, for many exiled Tibetans, including you know those who were activist community, it was also to question. So we could manage that. And immediately after that, I organized a major event where we had at that time remember. Uh, uh, various uh, people who became you know, um, uh, Dr. Lobson Sange was one of the speakers, but uh, Tenzin Tethong and many others who became political figures later, but they were scholars. I hosted them, organized event. I have hosted Dalai Lama. I've hosted one very senior Tibetan, the senior most Tibetan in the Chinese government who also here. But my heart has been very clear, and I've never used different voice. I've been very clear with the Chinese de delegation also that do they allow they expect platform here, right? They expect in the West to be heard, right? Everyone. But do they allow same platform in China? No, they don't. So when I have been invited to China, by the way, that is in the past, not now. I have had no invitation in the recent times. I don't think I'll be invited very soon there with my very public position on Tibet and China. By the way, I was also public then. The things that have changed in my view is not my politics. I have been the same, frankly. And those of you who have known me for 15 years, they know where my heart is and my politics is. Thing that has changed in my view since Xi Jinping has come to power, that whatever limited space and very limited space that existed in China, to at least try to inform the outsiders, or at least try to have some discussion, is gone. So the officials who would create this space for me in Beijing or in Shanghai, and I have, to say, I have talked of racism, I have talked of systemic racism. I, I didn't use the word colonization, but I did talk of racism vis-a-vis Tibetans. And there was a frank discussion around it. So that's largely gone now. So you can't have that kind of discussion anymore. And my sense is the scholars in China who would interact with me in the past have all gone quiet. Whether they have gone quiet or they have been in, removed from the system, I would not know because I have no contact with them. But something I noticed in China was there was some appetite, some appetite, to improve the situation of Tibetans in the past. But I feel that that appetite is gone. You see, so those who would invite me because they knew that I, as an outsider who's critical, remember, I criticize US, I criticize UK, I criticize India, I criticize uh, China. So they knew that I criticize everyone. I'm not uh, only criticizing China. So they had, there was some space for scholars like me in the past, not anymore, setting. So by now, I do think that. Dialogue is not possible until there's a change in China where there's a recognition that Tibetans, along with Uyghurs, are human beings as who should be. And one final thing, there was a scholar who's a very prominent scholar in China. He said something to me very clearly in uh, London when he came that while you're speaking of Tibetans, you are seen as a troublemaker. The day you start speaking around, and he talked of me hosting Rabia Kadir. I never hosted her, by the way. I was thinking of her hosting her. And I would have hosted more. If I get threat, I would like to host. You know, if someone threatens me, I'd do more. Uh, he said that the moment you start engaging with the Uyghurs, you become an enemy for China. Just remember that. Right? So the point is, we may talk of it later. There have been pressures on me. Sadly, pressure from Chinese government, pressure from Western academics who'd like access to China, who'd talk of liberal human rights here, who talk of racism and fighting against racism here, but they almost go quiet when they notice that how Chinese government starts targeting specific academics as selectively. So a long answer, short answer, I would say, is, look, it's a constant battle. It's not a battle that's been lost. It's a not battle that can be won. So we, the only way out for me as an academic is to recognize that I exist here. If I'm giving platform to Tibetans, to Uyghurs, I'm also giving platform to Chinese people and others, is to create a space where we can talk openly, but recognize that there can be no neutrality. I do not believe in neutrality in the face of authoritarianism.
Okay, I'll come, I'll come back to you on the academic infiltration in a minute. Uh, but let me go back to uh, go to uh, Lopsanyenda. You had played a sort of senior role in the um, Tibetan uh, Central Tibetan Administrative Leadership. Uh, you were health minister. Uh, you were also the finance minister. You were also the minister for the information and international relations uh, department. I mean, you you know that Tibetans have been engaging with the CCP regime now for about 70 years, one way or another. We can go back to 1951, 70 point agreement and so on. But since the, foreign, since the escape of His Holiness the Dalai Lama into exile in India in 1959, the C CTA, Central Tibetan Administration, has engaged in dialogues with the Chinese leadership, as I said, on and off since 1979. So far, no political resolution. And at the moment, there is no open dialogue as such between Dharamsala and Beijing. You visited, um, I believe it was 2006 when you were the minister. Now, can you please tell us whether there is a real hope for a long-term political resolution uh, to this China-Tibet conflict or not? If there is, then how can this be materialized? Can India or a third party or country play a role or roles that bring some tangible outcomes, including reducing the tension between Beijing and New Delhi, including on the on the border, on the uh, Himalayan border. Loksan? Okay, um, Simpasla, I, I remain optimistic uh, that Tibet issue will be resolved one day. Uh, even though uh, the current uh, China repressive policy in Tibet is not only curtailing the political and civil rights of the Tibetan people, uh, the very survival of the Tibetan identity is being threatened today. Uh, but there are different ways to look at an issue. Uh, you know, for Tibet case, uh, we, we now have a favorable, you know, at least international situation. Uh, US-led alliances are, uh, for the first time in many decades, seriously challenging China's aggressive behaviors. Uh, this has the potential to achieve real political support for Tibet, if, of course, uh, you know, Tibetans are able to grasp that opportunity. Uh, if we are able to make strategic plan uh, that will benefit the short term and long term interests of the Tibetan people. Uh, of course, changes in China's uh, domestic politics uh, can also affect the issue of Tibet. Uh, but we do not really know much about China's domestic policies because uh, it's, it's, you know, everyone says it's a black, you know, in a black box. So uh, despite the strong rumors of infighting and uncertainty, you know, some of the news even uh, coverage as recently as two days ago. But we really do not know what the uh, you know, domestic uh, infighting is taking place in China. But this could also have an impact on on on. Uh, you know, taking issues of uh, uh, different nationalities under the Chinese occupation. And uh, most importantly, you know, the proposal that put forward uh, by the Tibetan leadership and His Holiness the Dalai Lama to resolve the issue of Tibet is of mutual benefit, both for the Chinese and the Tibetan peoples. Uh, despite the hardline position you know, held by the Chinese leaders for the last now <clears throat> number of decades. Uh, you know, they are aware that this is a pragmatic approach and there's, and there's nothing better way uh, to find an amicable solution uh, to the Tibet issue. So, <clears throat> you know, I believe that Tibetan leadership have at least succeeded in making China understand uh, the true aspirations of the Tibetan people you know, during the uh, last, you know, uh, over three decades of engagement with Chinese uh, leaders. Uh, now the Chinese leaders know in detail that what Tibetans want and what are our demands, uh, you know, and that, and that 
these demands do not threaten uh, the core interest of the Chinese uh, government. It is you know, now only a matter of political will and courage uh, from the Chinese leadership uh, to agree to our proposal. Uh, and as, as I said, Tibetans also need to constantly engage uh, the international community uh, to prevail upon China to address the Tibet issue. And uh, this uh, international support and the pressure built towards China could also have a positive effect uh, on, on, on you know, finding uh, or engaging China to negotiate on the Tibet issue. And uh, you, know, you said about the third party. I, I believe the idea of third party you know, playing any official role uh, to engage in Sino-Tibetan dialogue uh, may not be uh, you know, possible. Uh, given the fact that the Chinese has been very adamant uh, since the first Tibetan contact uh, with Beijing, you know, they have made it very clear to us that no foreigners should be allowed to engage in any discussions uh, you know, uh, uh, that have taken place in the past. Uh, but there's always a way to make a low-profile diplomatic push on China to en encourage them to move forward. So as I said, you know, I, I am, uh, uh, you know, optimistic uh, that uh, uh, given the uh, very reasonable proposal that we have uh, presented to them, uh, and there is no better way out there uh, if China really wanted to uh, resolve the issue of Tibet, uh, you know, in the future. Thank you. I think optimistic is the word. Uh, I think also, I suppose, that needs to have a sort of some sort of liberal leadership rather than the hardline leadership, leadership who are sort of really willing to resolve. You know, under, it seems that under Xi Jinping's leadership at the moment, they're going more sort of hardline, you know, even challenge the US um, and its allies. I'll now move to um, move on to Stephen Sherrard, because you have lived in China and set up a uh, business there. I think from your experience, how does uh, the Chinese regime or even in the Chinese society over there treat, um, you know, uh, oppressed people? Uh, I mean, Tibetans, for example, and Uyghur Muslims, you know, even sort of Mongolians, you know, which are not what they call Inner Mongolians, but, you know, Southern Mongolians. Uh, are they treated differently from the hand, you know, by the Chinese uh, government or the Chinese state? Um, either through, you know, whether they have sort of, uh, what do you call it, um, in, in terms of law, in, through in law or in practice. So please uh, share your experience. Undoubtedly, yeah, it's a great question. Look, um, whether you're a, a, an ethnic minority in China or simply a foreigner, um, there is a sense of racial superiority that stems from the CCP. And I want to emphasize this is not a slight against the average Chinese citizen in any capacity. Uh, I've lived and worked around the world. I'm hard pressed to find a population that has been more kind or welcoming or warm to me uh, as, a, as an American than the average Chinese citizen. That being said, uh, there is a sense of racial superiority that is enforced on the population and it's done through clever use of language to divide us from them so one of the common things that you are kind of grow accustomed to living and working in china uh, are words like la lai or wai gorgan which are literally translate to, to, to foreigner uh, and that's simply what you're referred to as if you are a, you know, uh, non-Chinese person, you are referred to as an, uh, an outer country person is the literal translation. Uh, and, and it's meant to create this us versus them mentality. Now, you can look at quotes from uh, the education minister, uh, Yuan Guiyuan, the ex-education minister for the country of China, things he has said about the negative influence of Western ideals uh, you can look at the horrible persecution, um, and I don't use the term lightly, of what people are forced to endure. Uh, if you are a Falun Gong practitioner, Tibetan, uh, uh, or, sorry, Muslim Uyghur, uh, Chinese Christian, uh, Tibetan Buddhist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the full spectrum, uh, there is an us versus them mentality, and it's meant to elicit this very ethnocentric sense of nationalism that is unlike anywhere in the world. 
Uh, and if you read uh, prior CCP, again, anything from literature to speeches, uh, you look at you know things that Shi Hao Tian uh, has written about uh, the ex vice chairman of China's military commission, where he harps about uh, how Chinese uh, the Chinese populace, the Chinese national uh, kind of nationality, is racially superior to Hitler's Germans. Uh, it, it's very scary, and it's very easy to understand uh, why this is done, where this comes from. Um, why ethnic minorities are treated as second-class citizens, uh, why foreigners are treated uh, with such disregard and haphazardly carted off into uh, death row, uh, hostage diplomacy, black site prison cells. Uh, and it's done to kind of, again, build this ethno-nationalism, this very strong sense of racial superiority. We are the kind of, you know, uh, God's, you know, superior race, if you will. Uh, and that turns into some very scary things. And I'm the pessimist, I suppose, on all things China. Uh, when you look at the, in totality, what the CCP has written about and spoken about for the better part of decades, threats to nuke anyone that questions COVID, threats to nuke, to nuke Australia, uh, or to hit them with ballistic missiles because they wanted to defend Taiwan, threats against Japan and India with ballistic missile strikes or nuclear weapons uh, because they want to intervene with, with Taiwan. Um, I do believe that there is really only one way out of this debacle with a beast that largely is created by the West, um, which is the CCP, which is either economic or kinetic, ultimately warfare. And I have no doubt that that is what things will come to. Uh, not that it's what I want, not that it's what anyone wants, but realistically, um, where the CCP is, the military might that they have established and built and continue to expand on on a daily basis with ballistic missile testing, hypersonic weapons, uh, biological warfare, which they've written about for decades. This is back in the 90s and unrestricted warfare. Uh, this is where things are heading and a waning power, which I think Xi Jinping is uh, because he clearly does not make decisions that are beneficial for China collectively, um, even though that's what he asserts, uh, he will be stuck between um, and continues to be stuck between a rock and a hard place uh, on a monthly, if not annual basis. And at some point, there will be a cataclysm, there's going to be a catalyst that's going to turn that into something very ugly, where there will be no other option for Xi and the CCP to retain power in China aside from this continual and evolving, uh, very dangerous demonization of the West, of Australia, of the US. And again, you just have to look at it on a monthly basis. They're threatening, the CCP is threatening to nuke someone, uh, to go to war with someone, uh, whether it's US, India, Japan, et cetera. And that can only go so far before at a certain point uh, you actually have to do it. And I believe likely that is the culmination of where this is all going. Okay. Thank you very much. I am uh, aware of the time now. Uh, I'll come back to uh, uh, Stephen again, uh, if I may. Uh, you know, China has benefit, benefited immensely uh, after it entered the WTO. I believe it, it was the time when President Bill Clinton was in the White House. Many Western leaders hoped by allowing China to enter the WTO, that regime would change for the better uh, and become a more responsible global player. I mean, to an extent, um, respecting Western democratic values, freedom of speech, etc. Now we are, you know, actually we are in the opposite sort of situation. Uh, you know, not to forget hundreds of thousands of Chinese students over the past many decades, you know, they returned back home after receiving education in Western universities. Some would say Washington's toughening stance against Beijing peaked during President Donald Trump's term. It seems that President Biden's administration is uh, also 
carrying out some of the hardline policies against uh, on the East Coast. Um, so I can I can get lost in, in, in Trump versus Biden. I can get lost in US policy and I can I can harp about that for hours. But baseline we need to come back to do we have policies that advocate for reciprocity? Um, and really what reciprocity is if we don't have that, we then need accountability, right? So the entrance into the WTO, um, other you know kind of international organizations, that's all well and good, but if it's not um, if there's no accountability with the expectation that China is to act and behave in the same capacity that all other countries are meant to, and they have not, uh, then we are kind of, it's all for naught, largely. And that's what we're seeing today. Um, look, you see American products and goods that are taxed uh, at an impossible rate uh, in the Chinese mainland. You see uh, our products, goods, and services that are treated like garbage, whether that's a multinational you know, billion dollar capital, you know, powerhouse like Uber, which is, you know, kind of essentially kicked out of the country uh, because the government comes in and says, look, we're going to have one clear winner. That's going to be Didi Uh, Or you have small business owners like me who are Americans going into China to, you know, create a small educational consulting company. And we're overnight, you know, on the receiving end of state sanctioned kidnapping and thrown into a black site prison cell. Uh, there is no reciprocity. You don't have millions of students in, in for American students in China that are studying safely. You don't have safe access for our businesses in China uh, to be able to go out there. So what I expect to see from any um, president, be it Trump, be it Biden, uh, you know, liberal, conservative, whatever, I think of the spectrum towards China is, hey, you're not special. You're not better than the rest of the world. You're not better than Mexico or India or Japan or Ghana or Nigeria or Germany. You're on the global stage now. You're an equal partner economically, and we expect you to behave that way. And what that means is fair trade, fair practice, and there needs to be accountability when that does not exist. So what we should be doing is treating China exactly the way China treats the rest of the world and exactly the way China treats Americans which is uh, a complete lack of reciprocity and only until that will really be a catalyst for the Chinese people to start asking these questions, well, why is this? And that word that, hey, this is what is being done to us. And until that changes, until we treat you the way that you're treating us and we, we have baseline reciprocity, then we're gonna have to cut access to Chinese markets. We're gonna have to cut access to Chinese students. And it's unfortunate, it's not what we want. Uh, but right now, it's we we are really our our own biggest enemy insofar as we are funding um, this destruction of our economy, military, society, culture uh, at, at the expense of of our own people. It's 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 really it's, it's very harmful. So um, what we need to see from Biden, Trump, any future president, whoever it is, is reciprocity at, at the very least, and for us to enact policies that mirror exactly what China is doing. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Stephen. I think uh, you you really summed it up quite well. Thank you for that. I now go to the beige. Um, China's infiltration in the academic world. Um, what can you tell us about this infiltration, uh, including the Confucius Institute? Um, it is said that I think over 500 Confucius Institutes are set up across the world, and there are many in the UK as well. Is it a clear and present danger, a real threat to the academics? Do you have this discussion uh, within the academic community? If so, what is being done about it by the university and think tank institutions? And uh, personally, a personal question, if I may, have you or have you uh, have you ever been approached or ent uh, or enticed by Beijing or their agents uh, to join uh, their infiltration camp so that your, your academic record is compromised? Okay, thank you so much. You know, I'll start with the last part. Um, look, China is a very smart state. Something we have to acknowledge, right? While it's authoritarian, it's a bully, you know, it is oppressive. It's a smart state when it comes to diplomacy. So I find the diplomats from China to be much smarter and sharper than diplomats from some other countries, including the country I originally come from, which is India. Right. So for instance, I'll tell you, I organized an event on China-India border dispute uh, years ago. It's a contested border. The Chinese embassy tried to pressurize to get it changed, the title changed from China and a border dispute, which is what the title, to something else, right? And actually, Indian High Commission did the same. But the conduct of the Indian High Commission official was more of a bully than of the Chinese embassy official, by the way. That's what I'll clarify. So Chinese uh, embassy officials were more polite and trying to whine and dine and say, you know, maybe you should focus on cooperation and not on conflict. And the Chinese, so Indian High Commission officials were very clear that if you don't do it, then you access any... They will die. Now, I have had a situation where, so I don't think at any point there was a clear inducement that, you know, if you speak or do things around China, something good will happen. But the fact is, you know, these are subtle things. And I read, I'm, so I'm not ignorant. I can understand what's happening. The happening would be that, oh, if you are friendly, then maybe there'll be a center in, within your university or you'll get an invitation, more and more invitation to China. So more subtle, right? Especially with someone like myself who's very blunt. And I'm, those of you know me can imagine how blunt I can be. So even in China, I went and met a particular government official in you know, uh, office. And I said, but you are not communist. I, I believe I'm in communism, but yours is not communism. Yours is more like fascism. And they didn't like it. But them being polite didn't say directly to me that they didn't like it. But I strongly believe it. That's why I said, look, as a left, as a progressive, even let's say ideal communist, I would argue in favor of human rights for everyone. But the Chinese government is not human rights for everyone. It's a part of the republic. Coming back to it, in the UK, I've had threatened. I was explicitly, I can call it a threat, in this very office of my university, where a uh, particular, and by the way, this didn't happen when I hosted the Dalai Lama. At that time, I think officials were different. So it also depends upon who you have relation and link to. There was a year, a few years ago, uh, a senior and fairly senior Chinese embassy official came and said, oh, we want to talk about, you know, cooperation. I said, fine, come and speak here. Came to this office and talked about it. I said, you are, you have been friendly to us, but you're hosting all these events. And I was hosting uh, Dr. Lop Sang Sang. Now, other universities, I'll give you this again. Other universities that hosted Lop Sang Sang, Dr. Lop Sang Sang, very few of them did. They referred to Sik Yong Lop Sang Sang, or they said Dr. Lop Sang Sang. Our advert made it very clear. Prime Minister, government in exile. See, that's a difference. You know, in the West, you say Sikyong, no one understands what Sikyong. But the moment you say Prime Minister, government in exile, it's very explicit. Now, I know officially that's no longer the title, but I'm talking about time when it was. So I'm very on, I have to say I'm honest in that. I did say Prime Minister, government in exile, da, 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 right? So they said you're being hostile. And the official said that, look, if you do this, in the past, you have hosted the Dalai Lama. Now you're hosting this separatist leader. I said, but I've always hosted people. I've hosted you also. So what's wrong in this? And he's a position that if you do this in the future, we'll set an example, make an example out of you. And he said that in explicit English, that's the language I use, is we will make an example out of you. And my response was, if you threaten me with that, 
And if university ever tries to put me under pressure, and my university has never put me under pressure, right? But if they, I will resign. I'll go more public, and I'll make sure that every event I do is against you. So don't threaten me, because the idea: the more you push me, the more I'll do it. Right? That was my approach. Now coming back to UK, UK academy, I'll focus on that. Look, rather than using the word infiltration, it's part of it. Mind you, is largely influence. That's what I say. It is influence. Much of the discussion we have had at different universities, and I'm aware of China studies, Tibet studies. I will not blame the Chinese government for it. By the way, I'll blame Western academics for it or Western academia for it because we bend over backwards to accommodate others. Right. So we talk of principle of academic freedom. We talk of you know freedom uh, anti-racism, but when it comes to China, we forget academic freedom. So you'd find that there are very few scholars like myself, and I'm I'm not saying I'm an exception, but there are very few scholars like myself who openly speak against Chinese government. And the reason for that is not because Chinese government is pressurizing others, because others, one, they they want access to China. They think that if you don't criticize Chinese government, somehow it's fine. Then they come up with very contorted, and I'm sorry, but they come up with contorted logic that somehow criticizing Chinese government is criticizing Chinese people, which is somehow racism, and therefore we should not say it. And you know that's all sorry bullshit. I know it's polite, convenient, but that's all bullshit. Because criticizing Chinese government is not criticizing Chinese people, right? So because of economic reasons, because of our own contorted hypocrisy, and Western academia sadly has been ridden with hypocrisy for a long time. It's not new now, right? It is getting better. So in a way, Chinese government is exploiting those hypocrisies and making it weaker and dividing us. So much of Chinese China studies will be critical slightly of China, but they'll not say anything against Chinese government. They will not host you for them saying, "Oh, this right, or oh, Stephen." I mean, whatever talks you're giving, they'll try to avoid you because you'd be seen as, in this case, too critical, or even you're not. I don't know your politics, by the way. Right? I know saying politics, but oh, right wing or whatever. But I said. For someone like me, and I, I identify as left, I hope I organ Tibetan students in JNU, which is the premier institution in India, with left wing culture. Thankfully, they hosted a discussion in India, Indian left, because I want to argue that Tibet should be a left wing issue in India, right? As human issue, left wing issue, but not a single leftist student or academic came to the event. Why? Because of course, in their mind, somehow left is Chinese government and not. Tibetan population. So coming back to it, I would say Chinese government is partly responsible, but significant responsibility lies within ourselves in academic circle, where for various reasons, reasons of interest, reasons of hypocrisy, reasons of you know our contorted sense of racism, anti-racism, we end up bending over backwards to accommodate Chinese government and buying into the narrative that's being sold by the Chinese government. And I'll end with this: right, Chinese government have been very effective in weaponizing hurt sentiment. The moment you criticize China, oh, our sentiments are being hurt. And hurt China, okay, the sentiments of Chinese people are being uh, uh, hurt. And my point is, how can 1.3 billion people in the world have one sentiment that gets hurt so easily? It's a very powerful country. It's a very powerful people with powerful civilization. So we do know that it's not Chinese people whose sentiments are being hurt. It's a weaponization of that. So I do think that this is a debate within Western academia. If we are talking Western academia, here, debate has to have be had, and that's a debate that's internal. And we and I stick to the idea of academic freedom, academic principle. If we give up on that, which give up on that, which are willing to give up, then we will lose our core values, and therefore, and hurt Chinese people themselves. Because Chinese students come here partly, not all, but many of them come here to study about. Freedoms. If we, as a Western academics, or academics in the West, start changing our curriculum, changing our content to appease to what we think Chinese people want, we are being the racist ones. So I would say that the racists are not the Chinese in this case. Racists are those in the West who change the curriculum, change their viewpoint, assuming that Chinese students cannot take criticism. That's how I end. Thank you, Dibesh. Um, I'm I'm aware of the time. What I'll do is I'll go to Lawson's uh, Nyenda for one more question, then I'll come to you for the final remarks, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I'll... Nyenda, are you there? Yes. Oh, great. Um, 
His Holiness Dalai Lama, the Tibetan spiritual leader, is in his mid 80s. I think I think I said this earlier. There's no dialogue between Dharamsala and Beijing at the moment. Do you think China is buying time? Could there be a miscalculation on the part of Beijing, which could be detrimental to all parties concerned uh, in the long run if the China Tibet issue is not resolved during the lifetime of the current Dalai Lama? Please uh, share us your thought. All right. So, like, before I do that, I just wanted to uh, share my personal, uh, you know, experiences of dealing with China, uh, Chinese, you know, uh, leaders, uh, which is a little different from what uh, you know uh, DBH has experienced, I believe, uh, especially also with uh, you know with bit because I've been in India for a uh, number of years and have also had the opportunity to deal with lots of Indian officials. So, you know, here we have different kind of experiences. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Debesh is right. When it comes to, you know, negotiation, China is as polite as possible uh, in, in a sense to win over, uh, you know, the hearts and minds of uh, the, uh, the other party, uh, you know, be it be, you know, telling lots of lies and untruthful. Uh, but nevertheless, what I have experienced during my, uh, you know, uh, tenure as the representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lamas to, to North America, uh, you know, I have had uh, meeting engagements with, uh, you know, top political leaders, including U.S. President, Canadian uh, Prime Minister, uh, Senators, um, and as well as, you know, uh, uh, engagements with different educational institutions in North America. I, mean, I see here that China has been most undiplomatic, yeah, you know, in all these uh, efforts to uh, uh, rather to, you know, stop his on his uh, in, uh, schedules in all those educational institutions and meeting with, uh, you know, uh, uh, top leaders in the world. So, uh, you know, everyone, even, even including uh, you know, a president of a university, you know, they are all fed up with the way the Chinese, you know, uh, leaders pressure them uh, to, to, you know, to no talk, you know, before the Chinese, uh, you know, uh, wishes. So these are, these are very undiplomatic way that they have engaged with the international community uh, with lots of, you know, uh, pressure and falsehood, uh, you know, as compared to what India, uh, you know, uh, how India has been dealing with, uh, you know, the international community, particularly the Tibetans. You know, we have seen the contrast here, the, the, the truthfulness nature of, of, of a government, of a leadership. Uh, so having said that, uh, you know, the, the very important question that Sinila, you have raised about, uh, you know, uh, is, is China uh, miscalculating, uh, uh, you know, that they, you know, wanted to totally ignore uh, the presence of the 14th Dalai Lama here. And there definitely is a danger, uh, you know, uh, of China's miscalculation on the matter of His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, throughout the six decades of Chinese rule in Tibet. Uh, they have constantly vilified His Holiness uh, before the Tibetan people, of course, uh, and also tried to make His Holiness's is relevant, uh, you know, uh, to Tibet and Tibetan society, uh, but these attempts have failed miserably. Uh, now that His Holiness is in his uh, mid nineteen mid eighties, uh, it is possible that they are preparing for a Tibet situation without His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, you know, we surely need to make China understand that Tibet issue will not go away in the absence of His Holiness. Uh, on, on the contrary, uh, Tibet issue will become more complicated and could even become chaotic. If China wants to address the issue of Tibet, you know, they will not be able to find a credible Tibetan authority to deal with. Uh, most importantly, you know, China's opportunity uh, to address the legitimacy issue uh, to rule over Tibet will be lost forever. Uh, when China took over Tibet, uh, the 14th Dalai Lama and his government was the legitimate ruler uh, of our country, Tibet. 
and the Dalai Lamas had ruled Tibet for nearly 400 years. The 14th Dalai Lama alone, I believe, has the historical and moral authority in negotiating the Tibet issue. So what is more important uh, is that Tibetans need to prepare ourselves of such eventuality. You know, we need to have both short-term and long-term plans uh, to tackle any situations. Uh, particularly, uh, Tibetans need to work to strengthen the institution of the Dalai Lama and further promote the international recognition uh, you know, of the institution. You are muted, I believe, Sir Basla. Oh, thank you, uh, Lobsala, uh, for sharing your personal uh, experience of dealing with the Chinese officials and the leadership. Um, I'm very much aware of the time. What I would do now is give uh, the microphone to uh, Debesh for his conclusion remarks. Uh, uh, I think our top title today is, Is China a Threat to Global Peace and Security? Over to Debesh. Uh, thank you, Sering, again for inviting us here and for leading this important discussion. It becomes even more important because uh, you hardly have this kind of discussion outside the security strategic circles. And it's important to do this amongst activists, community leaders, anti-racist activists and everyone. Because the reality is, if you look at the conduct of the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese Communist Party state, so party state here, it is a threat to all aspects of humanity. It's a threat to an inclusive idea of development, an inclusive idea of development, which is not where the state liberates human beings, but actually human beings have rights and freedoms. It is very much against the idea of human equality. It's very much against the idea of all human beings equal. It's against the idea of freedom, of course, which we know of. It is based, essentially, the Chinese party state is based on the fundamental idea, which is a racist, colonialist idea that someone knows better than others what's good for the others. So the party decides what's good for Chinese people, what's good for Tibetan people, Uyghur people, Hong Kong people, and for Central Asian African people, and that's the direction, right? And that we know is a basically racist, exclusivist, majoritarian, and colonialist idea that we will tell you what's good for you. You don't know. And if you dare resist us, we are going to smash you. And that's the Chinese Communist Party approach. So once we acknowledge and recognize the Chinese party state as essentially a colonialist state, colonizing its, uh, the population within so-called territory of its own, but new colonialism elsewhere, we recognize that a genuine decolonization of the world, and I'm a strong advocate for decolonizing, a genuine decolonization of the world would recognize China as a threat, and therefore Chinese Communist Party as an enemy of decolonizing world. So as a belief of someone in freedom, as a belief of equality, justice, uh, anti-racism, and all these uh, forms of uh, justices, I would say, and freedoms, I would argue that we all need to pay closer attention to how it operates and how China manages to claim to be a victim of Western imperialism while being a practitioner of imperialism in China, in Chinese occupied regions, but also in neighboring uh, parts of the uh, in, in neighboring parts of the world. So I would end by saying that let's all be anti-colonial, let's decolonize the world and decolonize China. Because once we decolonize China, can we genuinely free Tibetans, Uyghurs, Hong Kong people and everyone else who wants freedom? Because every human being in the world has the right to be free. 